Argon low power reactor is a prototype of a power plant for Arctic operation. A specific requirement for a nuclear power plant proposed as a primary source of power for the military services in physically remote and relatively small Arctic installations was set forth by the Department of Defense to the Atomic Energy Commission. The design of the ALPR by the Commission's Argon National Laboratory incorporates information and experience gained from the early borax boiling water reactors and is an application of boiling reactor technology for a specific purpose. The cylindrical steel reactor building, which is divided into three levels, is set on piers to approximate construction on permafrost terrain. Ordinary sedimentary gravel, which forms the main biological shield around the reactor pressure vessel, fills the lower level of the building. Embedded in this gravel are various storage pits for used fuel assemblies and radioactive waste, and some equipment needing little attention but requiring appreciable shielding. The direct cycle boiling water reactor, fueled with highly enriched uranium and moderated and cooled by the natural circulation of light water, produces three megawatts of heat. Major power plant and auxiliary equipment are located above the reactor on the operating floor of the building. The ALPR, located at the National Reactor Testing Station in Idaho, is designed to supply a net output of 200 kilowatts electrical at full power and a maximum of 260 kilowatts in addition to 400 kilowatts of space heat. Ventilation equipment and the air-cooled steam condensing system are located on the fan floor in the top level. Wherever possible, the facility makes use of standard commercial components. All equipment is limited in size and weight to permit transportation by air. Components are prefabricated to reduce on-site construction. Connected to the reactor building by an enclosed stairway is the support facility building. The reactor and plant are controlled from this area. Instruments and controls are segregated on a plant process panel and a reactor control panel. All ALPR signal transmission and control actuator functions are accomplished electrically. Instrumentation is simple and dependable using economical and commercially proven components. A maximum of 59 fuel assemblies plus one special assembly containing an antimony beryllium neutron source can be loaded into the reactor core structure. Each fuel assembly contains approximately 350 grams of uranium-235 distributed in the meat of nine flanged plates. The meat, five hundredths of an inch thick, is an alloy of highly enriched uranium with aluminum and two weight percent nickel. The cladding material, developed at Argonne National Laboratory, is an alloy of aluminum and one weight percent nickel, and is thirty-five thousandths of an inch thick. Prior to the experimental reactivity studies, a three megawatt reference core loading had been specified, consisting of 40 fuel assemblies and enough boron for a reactivity control of 11%. The separated isotope boron-10 is used for control because of the magnitude of its absorption cross-section for thermal neutrons. As the core cycle progresses, 
most of this poison is destroyed by neutron capture, and the extra reactivity stored in the boron is made available to prolong the burn-up life of the core. The loading of fuel and of boron was selected on the basis of theoretical analyses indicating that the resulting 40 assembly core could be expected to operate for three years at average power. Steam heating coils were installed between the core structure and pressure vessel walls. The auxiliary steam heating was used during specific investigations to determine the reactivity effects of operating at various temperatures and pressures without excessively irradiating the fuel assemblies. The control rods were located within the control rod shrouds of the core structure. The neutron absorbing portion of each control rod is cadmium. The cadmium is enclosed by welded aluminum nickel plates, protecting it against corrosion and providing mechanical strength. It had been calculated that five cross control rods would provide sufficient control for the 40 assembly reference core. Together with space for 19 additional assemblies, the core structure was so designed that an outer ring of four T-shaped control rods could be used for additional control of reactivity or of the spatial distribution of thermal neutron flux in the 59 assembly core. Experiments were programmed to designate the three megawatt reference core of 40 assemblies and a 59 assembly loading. A temporary support for the control rod drive mechanisms was used to allow access to the reactor during the major portion of the critical experiments at atmospheric pressure and temperatures to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. The control rod drives were coupled to the control rod extensions. Vertical linear motion is imparted to the rod by a rack and pinion mechanism mounted above the reactor. A conventional 1 8 horsepower electric gear motor is coupled to the pinion drive shaft through an electromagnetic clutch. An activated antimony rod emits gamma rays which act upon a beryllium block to provide a supply of neutrons. On August 11, 1958, with standard operating procedures established and the loading detailed as to core location, assembly number and orientation, the program of reactivity studies was begun. One at a time, fuel assemblies without boron were loaded into adjoining locations near the center of the core. As each assembly was lowered slowly into its location, with the reactor safely below criticality, the multiplication of the source neutrons was followed on several neutron detectors. Following the sixth loading, criticality was approached by withdrawing rod number nine, the center cross rod, with all other rods out. The reactor reached an apparent critical condition when the rate of neutron production by the source and by fission events in the fuel matched the rate of neutron removal by leakage and absorption. At this point, the antimony rod was withdrawn gradually from its beryllium receiver. The neutron flux level was maintained by a slight additional withdrawal of the center rod to an indicated critical position of 23.6 inches. This first critical on August 11th, 1958, was the beginning step in the extended series of core physics experiments to determine important nuclear parameters and to permit the final designation of the two core loadings. The nuclear power level in all experiments was kept low to limit irradiation of the fuel until the experimental pre-power program could be completed. The core was enlarged systematically. 
the safety of a proposed loading change was evaluated from preceding observations of the changes in the control rod positions for criticality and from rod calibrations. In the process, reactivity effects of adding fuel assemblies to the periphery of the core were determined. When a loading of 24 fuel assemblies without boron had been reached, the addition of only a few more would have made the reactor supercritical, in spite of the full insertion of the control rods. The next set of loadings was programmed to terminate with the initial reference core of 40 fuel assemblies, each with one full-length poison strip containing nominally five-tenths of a gram of boron-10 in aluminum nickel. Forty of these strips were available, each strip being 26 mils thick and having the width of one fuel assembly, 3.875 inches, and the length of the active core 25.8 inches. On August 19, 1958, this first 40 assembly reference core loading, loading number 19, was attained. In loading number 19, preliminary calibrations of control rods were attempted moving the rod under investigation to the desired vertical position for positive period measurements. Criticality was attained by varying the position of one or more of the other control rods. The reactivity effect of a water hole resulting from the removal of a single fuel assembly was measured in several core locations. Using styrofoam to simulate voids in the region of highest thermal neutron flux, self-termination of a fast excursion of the cold fresh reactor was investigated. These experiments were performed to yield an estimate of the maximum safe concentration of soluble poison to be used in subsequent poisoning work. Preliminary measurements were made of the absolute and relative worths of two thicknesses of boron strips in various core locations. As indicated both by theory and by experiment, because of changes in the radial distribution of thermal neutron flux, the absolute worth is strongly dependent on the indicated rod position. In the case of the initial 40 assembly loading of boron strips, Rod withdrawal is accompanied by a sharp decrease in the reactivity controlled by the strips. The core loading was augmented gradually to 59 fuel assemblies with nine control rods. One 21 mil burnable poison strip containing nominally four tenths of a gram of boron 10 was taped to a side plate of each of these extra 19 assemblies. Rod control was supplemented by the incremental addition of boric acid to the reactor water, permitting the withdrawal of rods to various heights and allowing calibrations of all nine rods by positive period measurements. It was observed that the five cross rods were inadequate to control this 59 assembly loading. On the basis of these experiments and of earlier calibrations of boron strips in the initial 40 assembly loading, the metallurgy division of Argonne National Laboratory was asked to supply poison strips, each to contain eight-tenths of a gram of boron-10. It was anticipated that the use of these strips in a final 59 assembly core would result in a smaller penetration of control rods in the fresh operating reactor and would reduce control requirements to a point where the five cross rods would be sufficient. Until these strips were available, attention was focused on the final designation of the 40 assembly reference core loading. The boric acid concentration of the reactor water was reduced little by little, both by ion exchange and by replacement of reactor water with unpoisoned, demineralized water. By this means, 
The critical position of the bank of five cross rods was varied in the 40 assembly reactor over the entire range, from zero soluble poison to full rod withdrawal. Differential and integral rod worths were obtained over this range for the center rod and for the four off-center cross control rods. Enough soluble poison was added to withdraw the rods to the critical penetration anticipated in the operating reactor. And the worth of boron strips was measured as a function of radial position in the core. The steam coils were used to heat the reactor water to 170 degrees Fahrenheit for quick verification that the temperature effects on reactivity had been predicted with reasonable accuracy. With this reassurance, the final core loading, loading number 56, could be specified. Ten days of preparations for pressurized reactor experiments followed. The reactor core was unloaded and the specified burnable poison strips welded to the assemblies. Each carried a full 26 mil boron strip. An additional half-length 21 mil strip was welded to the opposite side plate of each of the central 16 assemblies in the lower half of the core. Gold wires were inserted into specified fuel assemblies in one quadrant of the core for subsequent flux mappings in the hot reactor. With the 40 assemblies reloaded, the pressure lid was placed on the reactor and the drive mechanisms reinstalled. On September 29th, the five control rods were calibrated in the cold final 40 assembly core using boric acid as before. In the following few days, the pressurized criticals for this core were performed, running at various pressures and at temperatures to 417 degrees Fahrenheit. With the reactor at 417 degrees Fahrenheit, and with rods banked at the position anticipated for three megawatt operation, the gold wires were irradiated. Between the 6th and the 9th of October, a reference loading of boron strips was specified for the 59 assembly core and the overall worth of rods measured. With this revised loading of burnable poison, it became possible to control the reactor using only the five cross rods. Using the steam coils again, the reactor water was heated to the operating temperature and boric acid was used so that flux mappings could be made with the rods inserted to the expected operating position. At the conclusion of these zero power reactivity studies involving 60 core loadings and 122 experiments, important nuclear characteristics of the reference core and designated full core loading had been measured. After two weeks devoted to systems tests, inspection, and cleaning of the fuel assemblies, the 40 assembly reference core was reloaded into the pressure vessel. On October 23, 1958, shield blocks were positioned and the reactor was brought to temperature and pressure by nuclear heating for the first time. The reactor power was raised until approximately 8,000 pounds of steam per hour was being produced. After a brief period of testing, it became evident that reactor operation was quite stable. The steam leaves the vessel through the main steam line. In normal reactor operation, the major portion of this steam is passed directly to the 300 kilowatt turbine generator set providing enough electrical power to satisfy electrical load requirements and to operate the auxiliary equipment of the plant itself. The balance of the steam is passed to a heat exchanger to maintain hot water in a secondary space heating system. The mass flow rate of steam to this exchanger is controlled by a thermostatic element in the secondary circuit. In the prototype installation, 
an air-cooled heat dump is used to simulate a space heating load of 400 thermal kilowatts. The condensate from the space heating heat exchanger is passed to a tank where some of it is flashed to steam at a temperature of approximately 135 degrees Fahrenheit. This flashed steam is ducted to the thin tube type steam condenser on the fan floor, as is the exhaust steam from the turbine. There the steam is condensed by the transfer of heat through the tube walls to an air stream created by the action of a powerful fan. Air cooling is used because of the likelihood of a limited water supply in sites where such a nuclear power plant might be used. The condenser and fan are sized to permit a normal full power production of 200 kilowatts of electricity plus auxiliary power and space heat at an outside air temperature as high as 60 degrees Fahrenheit at a sea level site. The condensate from the main steam condenser flows by gravity to the hot well from which it is returned to the pressure vessel by a feed water pump. In the event of the failure of one feed water pump a second pump is started automatically to carry the full burden. Feed water flow is regulated by a three element control system that correlates measurements of the mass flow rate of steam from the vessel, the feed water return rate to the vessel, and the reactor water level. Under equilibrium conditions, water level is held constant at a preset point, and feed water flow matches mass steam flow. Before the condensate enters the pressure vessel, it passes through the secondary circuit of the purification system heat exchanger. There it cools water being pumped from the reactor for filtration and ion removal at a rate of approximately three gallons per minute. Such cooling is necessary because of the temperature limitations of effective ion exchange. The purified water mixes with the water used to cool it and the mixture now termed feed water enters the pressure vessel through the lower feed water spray ring. In the downcomer, the feed water at approximately 175 degrees Fahrenheit mixes with recirculating water that has been heated to saturation temperature, 420 degrees Fahrenheit, by passage through the reactor core. The water entering the core is slightly subcooled, approximately 2 degrees Fahrenheit at full power operation and must be reheated to saturation before steam can be generated. One quarter of the heat transferred from the fuel plates to the water goes into heating the subcooled fluid to the saturation temperature. The remaining three quarters of the heat generates the steam requirements of the plant. In order to conserve fuel, it is desirable to adjust the steam output of the core to meet the varying steam requirements of the power plant. The ALPR is the first operating boiling water reactor in which this adjustment is performed by an automatic control system. A relay control amplifier automatically positions the central cross control rod in response to the deviation of reactor pressure from a set point. Operation of the argon low power reactor, now designated as SL1 stationary low power reactor, is under the control of an operating contractor. A program of research and development activities is being pursued, directed toward verifying the capability and increasing the utility of the plant for specific purposes. The association of the Argonne National Laboratory with this project is continuing in the form of consulting assistance to the Atomic Energy Commission. As of February 1959, the design of the ALPR represents the coordinated efforts of the architect engineers and of experienced Argonne scientists. The proving of the plant is being accomplished with the very material assistance of a cadre of military personnel.